get going. Um, I'm Hal Singer. I'm going to be the moderator to, uh, for today's discussion. Um, I'm doing this uh, with my uh, George Washington Institute of Public Policy hat on. Uh, this, is my, uh, this is my night gig. Uh, by day, I, I do uh, some antitrust consulting, usually lit as in litigation space. I'll quickly introduce um, everybody on the panel. It's very exciting to talk about uh, this topic that I think is on everyone's mind, the notion of what to do about dominant uh, tech platforms and whether or not antitrust is up, up to the task of policing these firms. Uh, just quickly uh, going down, uh, we've got Tom Struble. Uh, from, uh, he's the technology policy manager of R Street Institute and the, one of the hosts of today's uh, session. Uh, Chris, Chris Riley sitting next to me, director of public policy at Mozilla, uh, co-hosting today's event. We have Meredith uh, Rose, a policy counsel uh, from Public Knowledge, here with us today. Um, Marianella Lopez Galdos, uh, Director of Competition and Regulatory Policy at CCIA. And last, uh, Tad Lipsky, an adjunct professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason. Thanks for joining us. So let's, let's uh, kick this off with uh, the question that's on everyone's mind, which is the consumer welfare standard of, uh, that, that uh, undergirds antitrust enforcement. You know, there's a lot of, uh, it's under attack these days, and the question is whether, whether antitrust is really up to the task of policing the type of conduct that we're, that we're observing um, by, by tech platforms. Uh, uh, I'll start with what I think is one of the potential gaps in antitrust protection that I've written on, is whether, is whether um, antitrust can, uh, can accommodate uh, a harm to innovation, right? And so the, the reason why I'm skeptical here is that, is that, anti, is that an innovation harm, um, you can think of a guy or uh, a gal in her basement uh, just deciding to throw in the towel because she doesn't think that it's, it's, it's worth the effort uh, to compete against a vertically integrated platform uh, provider that has decided to compete in some adjacent market. And I would argue that it's very hard to detect and measure this type of harm, and if you're going to go into an antitrust court and you don't have a price effect or you don't have an output effect, uh, you could be in big trouble. So um, I, I want to put that out first to the panel, if anybody wants to weigh in. Do, do you think that, that uh, antitrust, uh, that, that an innovation harm is cognizable under antitrust law as it has evolved today? So I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I think that the um, the difficulty in measuring innovation harm is just part and parcel of a larger issue that um, we've tended to have over the last couple of decades, uh, which is, I say this even though some of my best friends are economists, I can say that totally honestly. Um, I think that we have a very difficult time in policy land dealing with things which are not readily quantifiable, um, and specifically quantifiable in dollar terms. Um, so whenever you're trying to assess anything like an innovation interest, that's going to run into the problem of inherently trying to, to, at some level, it's not that it's not valid, but at some level you're kind of trying to read the tea leaves um, about where, you know, do counterfactual future looking um, assessments. Uh, you know, we see problems with this all the time uh, in terms of other non-monetary harms. A lot of consumer dignitary harms are very poorly considered. They are still technically cognizable under the consumer welfare standard, but in practice a lot of times it boils down to uh, profits and dollar signs. Um, so we see this right now with the Equifax leak where there's a lot of potential future harm, there's a lot of dignitary harm, people feel very violated, um, there's a lot of anxiety around it, but it's very difficult to figure out how the law should deal with that when we don't necessarily have a strict dollar figure and any dollar figure we do have is speculative. So, Thanks. Does anyone have a, a contrary opinion or an affirming opinion? So I'll, I'll follow up on that. Uh, so, I mean, I guess in the Equifax case, I mean, that FTC is currently investigating that. I, can't, I agree that it's a tough one to assess based on current data, but we'll see how they handle that. But going back to the initial question about innovation harms, uh, so I think antitrust has recognized innovation harms in the past. Uh, I guess the example that I'm most familiar with is the AT&T breakup in the 1950s. We had the nationwide telephone monopoly, but also Bell Labs developing all these equipment. And they were effectively sitting on patents that threatened their business model. Like I'm thinking of Carter phone, like wireless telephony was invented by Bell Labs decades before the Carter phone was eventually brought to uh, use after the patent expired. But we had sort of innovation harms as the main theory, or one of the main theories in the AT&T breakup, which initially, I guess in the 50s, resulted in a consent decree. And then eventually in the 80s, they did come back and break them up. But that's, I guess, the main case that I'm aware of in terms of innovation harms. And I think it was um, a deciding factor in that case. 
but it also took DOJ decades to build that case and eventually get the outcome they were seeking against AT&T. So I think the standard is right, but maybe it isn't as nimble as certain people would like because it's very difficult to prove innovation harms. And we'll get into the speed next. Uh, that is, that's the next impediment. Go ahead. Yeah, let me add a, a different view here, and let's go a little bit backwards. The, until we got to the consumer welfare standard, there's been a whole evolution in the antitrust laws and in the decisions, et cetera, and we fine-tuned the antitrust systems to ensure that whenever we enforced antitrust, the consumers will be better off. And I think one of the, the I mean, innovation is part of the, that test already. I think not only in the U.S., even in the U EU, we see that they, they care about innovation, but they are very careful, and that's why the consumer welfare standard is the right standard to ensure that the right equilibrium exists in the ecosystems to make sure that innovation happens and consumers get the better deal out of the competitive process. If innovation <coughs> was harmed, if antitrust wouldn't be effective enough, how is it possible that innovation is happening here in the U.S. and not elsewhere? Okay. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so just to rewind it a little bit and to give a little bit of context for why Mozilla is up here and co-hosting this, why I flew out from San Francisco for it, um, Mozilla's mission is to make the internet healthier, essentially, to uh, keep it more open. We, we've worked on a lot of policy issues in this vein. And this issue in particular goes back to our very history. We were created as a business in order to push back on Microsoft Windows and Internet Explorer. Um, I like to think we were pretty successful in that, in that we broke this open and now nobody you know, has to use Internet Explorer if they don't want to. So we left, uh, we think, a, a lasting impact on this. Um, but that, the freedom that we had to do that at the technical level is not something we can rely on today. So I, I profess I am not an economist. I like to joke I've taken two economics classes in my life, macroeconomics and then behavioral economics, in other words, why everything in macroeconomics is wrong. Um, but I am a recovering computer scientist and a recovering lawyer. And so wearing that hat, I look at the way different sectors of the technology ecosystem interact with each other, the way information is exchanged, the way services are built on top of these platforms. And I look at the growing vertical integration and how these things are being um, effectively linked together and not uh, built according to open standards and open methods of interconnection in the way they were when Mozilla was founded and when we took the Netscape code from AOL and then turned it into Mozilla Firefox. And I also remember my antitrust classes in law school and, and the colleagues who I've talked to in the legal community since then. Um, and although I, I think the principle of maximizing consumer welfare is still completely valid, I do have some questions about how that will play out going forward in this complicated context. I'm glad you mentioned Microsoft because I want to put a, a question to Tad. And I'm going to bring you up to, uh, up to speed by about 20 or 30 years, uh, <laughs> Tom. Uh, at and is a good case, but, but Microsoft I think is the last what I'd call pure innovation-based uh, case brought under, under, the, under the Sherman Act. And as a, as a quick refresher, you know, there, there really wasn't a price effect. No one was concerned, I don't think, that Microsoft, after running Netscape out of the market, out of this adjacent market to its platform, was going to raise the price of the browser. The, the concern instead was that if, if Microsoft could get away with this, then what would that do to, to innovation and actors in these adjacent markets? Would they just throw in the towel? And so I have a question for Tad, which is, the, if this was the last case, just assume that this is a fact, I think it's true, if this is the last case that was brought by an antitrust agency in the United States, you know, what is it now, uh, 20 years ago? Um, what has happened? Why, why hasn't there been uh, another case brought, and a pure innovation-based uh, theory of harm brought by an antitrust agency in the last two decades? Wow, uh, lots of uh, components to the answer to that. Uh, one, one answer is that uh, not only is uh, innovation hard to measure, uh, but it's also, uh, there, there's a very persistent and, and uh, fundamental dispute about which competition policy is optimal in stimulating innovation. We, we finally arrived at a point where there seems to be a very broad consensus that innovation is incredibly significant. As a matter of fact, even uh, avowed uh, Democrats like Robert Solo mm -hmm. uh, will say that fully half of the increase in global productivity over the last couple centuries is attributable to innovation. So I think we have the entire antitrust community, at least, uh, willingly signing up to the idea that you must be careful uh, what the effect of your enforcement policy is on innovation. So we've got that settled. But there's still this huge debate. Uh, you know, d uh, should we uh, 
force unbundling? Should we, uh, you know, deter different kinds of uh, vertical or conglomerate integration uh, as a way of stimulating innovation? There's still a tremendous debate and no consensus uh, resolution, and even in specific cases like uh, Microsoft. Now, an another, uh, the Microsoft uh, case that, that you mentioned, now another uh, uh, component of this is that it's, it's very rare that antitrust encounters a problem that is, that is uh, widely perceived as a monopoly problem. Now, there are certain industries where there have been uh, important antitrust cases where there was really no question about that. Um, Otter Tail Power Company, uh, which uh, involved uh, the distribution, the wholesale distribution of electricity, which was essentially a protected uh, monopoly at the time and still is structured primarily as a regulated monopoly. This, this is the, the huge interstate distribution mechanism. Uh, or um, or AT&T, which had a, a legally protected monopoly for a long period of time uh, in uh, all forms of telecommunications in the United States. But it's outside of those uh, you know, path-breaking cases, it's very difficult to identify places where monopoly power is regarded as such a serious problem that antitrust inter intervention is justified. And uh, I'm, I feel compelled to point out that one, you know, the, uh, uh, Barack Obama was one of the few presidents in modern history who came into office with a, with a statement of his antitrust policy. And one of the things he stated, and one of the things that his first assistant attorney general stated is, there, there are going to be Section 2 cases because those, those uh, bushies just didn't, uh, apparently just, they weren't looking hard enough or they didn't find them or they, they didn't believe in them and so, and so they didn't bring any cases. But in fact, the Obama administration uh, came and went without a really significant Section 2 case. And so uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a rare bird, so we shouldn't be too shocked uh, that we're not finding very many of them. And, and if I may briefly add, and without updating the Sherman Act Section 2 guidance after overturning what the previous administration had done. Correct. Now, <clears throat> it sounds like there, there may be a consensus, may, maybe not a full consensus on the panel, that, that it would be pretty hard to bring, to bring a case under today's standards, if all, antitrust standards, if all you had was innovation-based harm. And so what you see is a, a, some proposals out there. Senator Klobuchar has one. Uh, this would, would amend uh, the Clayton Act to, to accommodate certain concerns that might fall outside of the consumer welfare standard, like the effect of, of labor inputs, I, I believe, uh, changing the presumption around uh, so as to make mergers presumptively illegal with the burden of proof, I, pr I presume, on the, on the merging parties. There's, um, there are proposals out. I think Lena Kahn has a piece about how the Sherman Act standards could be changed with respect to predatory pricing law. And the question I want to put to the panel is what, what are your feelings about about trying to go after these issues that may not be cognizable under the consumer welfare standard by amending uh, the Sherman Act or amending uh, the Clayton Act. I can jump in. So um, as I said before, I like the consumer welfare standard. I think it's a wise policy choice. Mm -hmm. And I don't think innovation happens in, in the US by coincidence. That being said, I think economic analysis in the evolution of, of antitrust uh, cases has played an important role. And I'm not sure if we can reconcile other interests rather than consumer welfare in that economic analysis. Uh, I'm not saying that other uh, public, in, uh, public persons are unimportant. I'm sure employment is important. I'm sure environmental issues are very important. I'm just saying that I don't think they fall under the consumer welfare or the antitrust umbrella. Antitrust is about consumer welfare. Let me give you a different perspective again on why I stand here. There's an evolution in the life cycle of competition, uh, competition systems all around the world, and currently there are more than 124. So w there's a lot of experimentation out there, and we can observe what's going on out there. In the US, there was a time as well initially where other other goals were embedded in the antitrust analysis, and we thankfully moved forward towards consumer welfare, fine-tuned the system, and that's why we have a, the right ecosystem here in the US. There are other competition systems that are more, uh, they are younger, let's put it this way, and they still have uh, other goals embedded in the antitrust analysis, 
And for example, in Zambia or in Namibia, they do take into consideration employment issues when they do the, the analysis of antitrust uh, cases. Also, courts have that into, into account, but I don't think the U.S. wants to be compared to Zambia or Namibia or any other younger jurisdiction. I think we move forward, we progress, and that's a way to keep going. Good. Yeah, I'll follow up on uh, Nella's points because, yeah, I think it is important before we talk about current antitrust law to think about how we got to where we are today and for talking about cons and Amazon's antitrust paradox, maybe go throw it back to in the 50s and talk about Bork's uh, antitrust paradox. So at the time, antitrust law in America was very skeptical of vertical mergers. Bork came out and said that, no, actually, we shouldn't be because even if it is the case that a vertically integrated firm can foreclose competition from non-vertically integrated firms because they can't manufacture the product or service as efficiently as the integrated firm. That might not be a problem because consumer welfare may not actually be harmed by that foreclosed competition because we decide the law shouldn't focus on competitors and harms to competitors in certain markets, but is it actually good in the end for consumers or not? So that was, I think, the article that you know sort of pushed back on the prevailing wisdom at the time and pushed us to where we are today. And I would say Lena's article is sort of, uh, I guess, a response to Bork, you know, several decades on where traditionally, or I guess right now, antitrust law is more friendly towards vertical mergers. And she's suggesting there should maybe be a change in law back to be more skeptical of them. Go ahead. So uh, I think the first point that I want to establish is making changes to the Sherman Act or the Clayton Act would be a very big deal. And it's, I think it's important for all of us to bring a degree of humility to this, right? These would, would have incredible effects. Um, and, and so we need to bring different people, different voices, and different perspectives to the table when we consider things like this. But I do want to consider them. I think it's equally important not to be afraid of changing things up, because I, I, I mean, certainly my perspective is that we need to. So whether you agree with me or not that we need to be making changes to this legal framework, uh, this is a global country, global environment. It's a global issue. And right now, the EU is leading. So I don't have a dog in the fight over whether the EU or the US leads. Uh, I and Mozilla, we work in Brussels, too. Um, but I, I think that to the people in this room who focus on setting policy right in the US, it's, it's important to be part of that global conversation as it develops and, and to make sure that our perspective and, and our voices are, are part of this and that we're not letting norms be shaped on this topic by others. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll move on to a topic, but I'll just say that, that you, could, you can care and be, and be concerned about these sorts of harms and address it in, in ways outside of, of uh, changing the antitrust standards. Uh, as an example, <coughs> I'll just point out that in 1992, Congress amended the Cable Act to create uh, a venue to, to uh, protect independent cable networks against vertically integrated cable operators, uh, with full recognition that the antitrust laws existed back in 1992. It's just the notion that, that they believed that there needed to be some kind of extra layer of protection. We'll get into a discussion of, of remedies in a bit, but I just wanted to put that, that place in the sand. We've been talking about some pretty high-level abstract things, the standard and stuff. I want to kind of get down into some brass tacks, um, cases that, that are actually occurring right now. and and and. I want, to, I want to know from the panel, do you think it's an issue? And if so, where would you, where would you like to see the, these types of cases get resolved? So let's start with um, a, a vertically integrated platform provider, not to pick on Google, but we'll, we'll start with Google, uh, that's decided that it wants to give itself a preference in its search algorithm so that, say, its, its local search properties are brought to the top of the, of the search results. Uh, and, and Yelp, for example, is discriminated against and moves down the queue. Um, uh, I, I want to know, just going down the panel, is this something that, that uh, is, is ripe or cognizable for the antitrust laws? I mean, first of all, is it a concern that, that you guys worry about? And if so, how would you attack it? So I'll start. Um, so I guess thinking about uh, search results in Google um, across the board is, I guess, more, somewhat difficult. But focusing on the EU recent case about Google shopping results, I guess that's a more discrete example. This would be sort of similar to self-dealing, which has, I guess, long been a type of harm or an issue in antitrust law. And as with many things in American antitrust jurisprudence, we used to have per se prohibitions on things like self-dealing or exclusive, um, exclusive dealing, uh, price maintenance, all these things that we eventually decided that the per se prohibitions didn't make sense and we should subject them to rule of reason analysis instead, because even though certain practices may generally tend to harm consumers or competition, 
there are always exceptions. We have to look at the ind individual factors in each case. So I think the Google Shopping is a sort of example of self-dealing, which the antitrust you know, law does not prohibit per se, but it could, under certain circumstances, violate the law. So let me follow up on, on Tom. Um, I am in favor of sound antitrust enforcement. I think it's very necessary. Um, I don't see any antitrust concerns in favoring rather than discriminating my own improved products against somebody else. It's good for consumers. And uh, with respect to the EU shopping case, Wow, I mean, I'm the European sitting here in this panel, <laughs> and <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and first of all, we need to to wait to see what the courts are going to say, because frankly speaking, the theory of harm that the com that the Commission and we will see it in the decision raises is a traditional monopoly leveraging case. But then, when it comes to the law, they fail to apply the tests that have existed within the EU for a long time now. So I would be cautious in, in, in claiming that the shopping, the Google shopping case in the EU is the way to go, because I'm not so sure that the courts will be of the same opinion. And I'm sure that in the re near future, we're going to see a lot of uh, debates, not so much of, over whether the fine was correct or not, but about the implications of that case for the sector. Because in Europe, there are voices and loud voices that are worried that 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 case, if upheld by the courts, is going to change the whole competition system and is going to drive Europe away from trying to, to, to bring about some innovation that, by the way, doesn't exist. I can say this here, but... <laughs> yeah, if I could add just briefly, uh, I, I agree certainly that it is um, too soon to really understand how the repercussions of the Google's uh, Google shopping decision in the EU will play out, in large part because we don't know exactly how Google's proposed forward-looking solution is going to work in practice. Um, I am glad to see uh, a, a deep investigation of the potential harms of that kind of work, of what they had, what they did in that case, which was not reordering the algorithm itself, but rather embedding something above the organic results, um, something which, uh, in, in the minds of certainly the EU, gave Google an, an embedded preference in a different market. Um, uh, we're still evaluating how Google has proposed that. We don't have the full details on that either. I don't, I don't think anybody outside the EU uh, government institutions and Google does. Um, if, if, in fact, to get back to your original question, I think the algorithms that are used in Google search results and in Facebook's news feeds and similar things like that, they are so complicated with so many data inputs at this point that I would be deeply skeptical of, of any practices to intentionally preference their own properties within that algorithm itself. I don't think that's the harm that we should be looking at as much as the shopping kind of playing around with how the organic algorithmic inputs are manually embedded with other pieces in the layout, which is what, what shopping was. But um, I certainly, at, at the bottom, uh, am worried about actions like this, absolutely. Well, let me, I, I don't want to pick on Google, so let's pick on Facebook a little bit instead. I've got two cases and we're limited for time, so randomly I'm going to choose the second one. But I, I, I came across a, a great story by Elizabeth Waskin in the Washington Post um, in which she interviewed, she said, two dozen Silicon Valley um, investors and entrepreneurs and asked them what the number one thing on their mind was when it came to innovating uh, in the app space and what they were thinking of. And, 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 they, and the answer across these 24 was that if, if Facebook could copy your app, and embed it into its into its uh, into the mothership, oh, yeah. right? Uh, then then you wouldn't get funding. Um, and so my my question for for the for the panel is: um, Let's assume that this is happening. I think I think that she gave an example of an app that Facebook is using called Anovo. Uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. That acts like a like a, a, a VPN. It's basically tracing Facebook users when they go outside of the, the Facebook suite of services, finding out what's popular, and then copying the, that app and putting it uh, on, its own, on its own platform. My question, I'll start with Tad, I mean, is this, does that sound like a case that you could bring uh, in an antitrust court, you know, copying an app and embedding it into the platform? Well, that's, uh, to some extent, that's an imitation of the Microsoft case, uh, because micro remember where that case started, as, as the Mozilla representative reminds us, was all, it was all about browsers and there was this prevalent fear that well you know if uh, Microsoft could eat up any field of endeavor that depended on the, on the PC space by introducing a similar app uh, 
uh, how are we ever going to get additional apps? Well, uh, you know, that was before Google and before Facebook and before um, Amazon <coughs> really became a, a phenom. So there's, it's very dangerous to focus on a, a small part of the ecosystem. And although fa Facebook is a monster thing and very significant in social media, it is still a very small part of the ecosystem where a lot of people don't use it. Uh, and and survive uh, pretty nicely, and so uh, you know, and and there's a similar uh, kind of uh, you know, a, a, an instinct to limit your vocabulary when talking about Amazon. Well, everybody always cites well, the Amazon is X percent of uh, online commerce. Well, uh, last time I looked, online commerce I think is still struggling to get up to like in the seven eight percent of all of all commerce, uh, all retail sale. Uh, kind of level, and so and so Amazon is still, even though they look they, they look and are huge in, by some measures, to the measures that are that are essential to evaluate whether there's a tangible risk to competition, uh, that's not necessarily true that they've reached a, that reached a level of concern. I mean, I'm familiar with other cases where it was alleged that there was uh, a monster uh, distribution utility was arising, and if you couldn't get distributed through that utility, whether it's whether it's Walmart or the or the uh, uh, full service, uh, quick serve restaurant, food distributors, whatever it is. There, there's, uh, antitrust history is littered with cases just like that, if I, uh, where the plaintiff says, if I can't get distributed through that guy, I can't get distributed at all. Pretty much they all fail. And I, I don't know the facts of Facebook, but I'm, I'm willing to bet that the odds are pretty good that that, that kind of allegation will fail as well. So I think this is this sort of comes up as as part and parcel of a larger issue, and just sort of step it back a little bit. Um, you know, the recurring issue with antitrust is always how do you define the market, how do you define the product, uh, and I was actually kind of hoping you were talking about the other Facebook case because that was one I was I was <laughs> following a little more closely. The fake news, fake news. Oh no, I was thinking about the um, the. WhatsApp, TBH. Oh, this is no. I'm I'm here. I'm here. We're here. With okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think probably the Instagram case is a little more um, relevant here. But you know, the Facebook acquiring Instagram. Um, there was a very interesting Strategi post that was just up um, earlier this week, arguing, making a you know a compelling argument. I think that um, Facebook should not have been allowed to purchase Instagram in the first instance. Um, I think one of the unique factors about the tech space outside of, you know, the normal, the pace of innovation and and the sort of relative regulatory freedom they have in a lot of, of fronts uh, is that you have a lot, you have a very hard time defining a substitute product uh, when you're talking about the tech space, especially when you're talking about large platforms with network effects like Facebook. Um, there's a there is an argument to be made uh, that Instagram, while not a one to one substitute with Facebook because it did not have all the same features, it was asymmetrical as opposed to symmetrical, was a close enough substitute uh, that it being folded under Facebook's wing effectively removed a competitor from the market. Uh, now the UK Office of uh, I don't know what the exact title is Competition uh, and Markets Authority. Market. Competition and Markets yeah. Authority. Um, uh, they essentially found that it was, they did an analysis which said like, well, they're not really strict competitors because one of them is more focused on photos and the other is focused on status updates. And uh, there's not going to be a lot of lost revenue because there's no revenue that's coming out of Instagram at the moment, which anyone who's worked in the space is going to go, well, no, you don't get revenue at first. You're at step one of a step four process and step four is sell ads. Um, so essentially it removed what could have been a very viable um, and vibrant and aggressive competitor to Facebook in the social media space. Uh, and so, you know, this is sort of more largely indicative. And I think, I think we, we have fallen into this idea where we have traditional antitrust law was built around concepts of railroads and steel and goods that were between different uh, manufacturers largely substitutable for each other, more or less identical. Um, you know, the old sort of, I make a red widget, you make a blue widget sort of situation. Um, we now have a, you know, we now have, uh, especially in sort of network effect uh, platforms, no one's going to, there's no reason to make a clone of Facebook because Facebook exists. Um, you can make something slightly different than Facebook. Uh, there is a great, um, there's a Facebook group that I'm on, 
ironically, uh, called One Sentence Startup Pitches, where people will go through these sorts of jokes about Facebook, but for dogs, um, and sorts of those kind of zany ideas. And so, I'll, you know, you can make something with a slight spin on it, but there's no reason to sort of overbuild on a product that's already there. Uh, and so, by definition, you're always going to have to assess how close of a substitute are these things. And again, you're going to try to be stuck reading tea leaves about like what is a viable, and you have a regulator in Washington sitting peering at this going, could this be a viable competition to Facebook in 10 years, um, which is not an easy situation to do. So I think this is sort of systemic problem with any sort of uh, antitrust analysis in this field. So just to add quickly to that, two, two points. One, I cannot emphasize strongly enough the fluidity of technology and in thinking about features. And if you just sit down for a minute and try to, to figure out and draw boxes and definitions around what is a social media system, what is a publishing system, what is a social network, what is a messaging system, you cannot box the apps that we use every day into clean categories like this. And even if you did, a year from now, they would not be the same. So the, the fluidity and the overlap within the space is what makes it so hard to engage in traditional economic uh, antitrust market market analyses, right? Um, second, uh, somewhat unrelated point, it... it although, although that Ben Thompson piece did have that cute little graph in it, <laughs> I, it asymmetric and symmetric, one to many, one to I, one. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would have wanted to add like trajectory arrows for some of those dots, because I'm not sure that you can just lock them in for one time. Um, but it was helpful. Uh, then to Ted's point, I absolutely think you're right that that traditional the, the the doctrine that we have in front of us today would not go to a situation like this, which is interesting to me if you think about this from a sort of a follow the money point of view. And I, I will say two follow the money observations here. One is to look at the mobile advertising market. It is almost unquestioned that there are two people that matter in mobile advertising: Google and Facebook, and that's it. And the other follow the money market is look at where VC dollars go. VC dollars today are, are thought about differently and invested differently, fundamentally differently than they were 20 years ago. They're, they're investing in companies to figure out how quickly those companies can cash out by being bought by a larger company. And there's something wrong with that. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we've picked on Google, we picked on Facebook. It wouldn't I be, picked on both of them. <laughs> it, it wouldn't be complete if we didn't also pick on ISPs. So, so let me let me turn the subject to, to net neutrality. And for me, th this this issue kind of blends together as an economist. I'm thinking about a, a platform provider that that if it wanted to could could extend into the content space or to the app space, or make otherwise make life difficult for independent app providers. But but there, for some reason, the, the conversation about about interventions uh, starts off with a fight between ex ante prohibitions like thou shalt not engage in certain conduct, a prohibition, for example, on paid priority, uh, uh, versus ex post case-by-case -case adjudication pursuant to some sort of standard. And, you know, we can go through the history of the FCC, but, you know, Julius Janikowski in 2010, uh, in the 2010 order, famously rejected ex ante prohibitions in favor of case-by-case -case, uh, review of paid priority uh, with, the, with the twist, which got him in trouble in the court, that, that any such arrangement would be presumptively in violation of the non-discrimination standard. <coughs> and more recently, Tom Wheeler in 2015 um, embraced a case by case review, uh, again with a twist subject to a nebulous general conduct standard. But if we just back up, uh, maybe you can help help us think through how do you how do you make the decision uh, to go with an ex ante prohibition uh, versus uh, an ex post case by case review. What are the factors that would that would tip you in one of those two camps? Meredith, so yeah, so I'll I'll jump up because picking okay. on ISPs is my day job. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that you have to always start with is what are the harms you're trying to prevent? Now, I'm going to speak as a consumer representative. My organization works for consumer rights and consumer advocacy. Um, so as a consumer, there's a whole bunch of things that you are basically subject to as just the way the market has played out through a whole host of forces. I have exactly one broadband ISP that I can acquire in my apartment. Uh, and to get another one, I would have to move house. Uh, there's an ongoing debate about whether or not my wireless carrier counts. That's a totally separate debate and would take up a whole other hour-long panel. Um, and if you, if the harm that you are trying to prevent is that I, as a consumer, have full and unfettered access to the entire ecosystem of online content, then you have this choice. Well, okay, so assuming there's an incentive for an ISP to not allow me that access through one means or another, how do you best address that problem. First, you have to agree that it is a problem, which, you know, a lot of folks say that's not a bug, that's a feature uh, from the business perspective. Um, 
So for a regulatory perspective, you can either do ex ante or ex post. Now, the problem with ex post is that I, as an average consumer, am really not in a good position to know when my speed has been tampered with uh, or to know it in any kind of reliable fashion that would give ground for an action. Uh, very famously, we discovered that uh, Comcast was throttling BitTorrent traffic because a guy went home after a breakup with his girlfriend and decided to BitTorrent an entire collection of barbershop music. Uh, and he noticed that for whatever reason, he could not get normal speeds on this massive cache of barbershop music. And he happened to be someone who was a network engineer. And he was actually able to sort of pin down like, hey, it's just my torrent traffic is being selectively throttled. And that's how that all came out. Uh, now, that's a really extraordinary set of circumstances for a lot of reasons, one of which being someone listens to barbershop music. Um, but I, as an average consumer, and even as someone who works in the tech space, am really not in a position to know. I can tell that I'm being harmed, but I can't necessarily know if this, like, where the problem lies. I can't know if this is Comcast doing it. I can't tell if maybe Netflix's service is down. I can't tell if, um, you know, Spotify's undergoing regular maintenance. I'm not positioned to know when I'm being harmed by this particular set of conduct in any tangible or systemic way. Uh, you also have problems that, again, it happening specifically to me is one degree of harm, which, you know, as a consumer advocate, I think that's a pretty big one if any individual person gets their access throttled like this. Um, it's another if they start doing it to entire census blocks. Uh, that is a very different problem, and then you get into all other kinds of concerns. Um, so I think the, the short version is, Frankly, it is easier to have ex ante rules with enforcement than to have ex post adjudication, which inherently relies on an unsophisticated consumer being able to collect sufficient information and then deliver it and then sort of go through the entire long tail process of, of getting a ruling made. Now, you went to what I would consider to be the most extreme or overt form of, of uh, discrimination, the block or the throttling. There, of course, is a whole, there's a whole rainbow of flavors mm. of discrimination. There's more subtle or mild forms of discrimination. You have paid priority in which you would, in exchange for, for, for payment, you would, you would treat certain packets with, with special attention, uh, QS, what we call quality, or, or uh, oh, I forget the phrase now, but uh, QS needy packets, like tele telemedicine application, mm -hmm. would get special treatment as it moves across an ISP's um, uh, pipe. Uh, you also have zero rating plans, in which case you would um, you could pay to get around a data cap on a wireless. And so, again, I want to put the question to the panel: How do we think through ex ante versus ex post on these more what I'll call mild or subtle forms of discriminatory conduct? So, I, I guess I view regulation in the telecom industry at the FCC through a similar competition lens as antitrust at the FTC. Uh, so, I guess when we're talking about you know per se rules versus case by case adjudication, generally we have per se rules when we're very familiar with what we're dealing with, and we know that this conduct always or almost always causes harm. So we're comfortable with a per se ban, maybe with you know certain exclusions, like even the per se bans on blocking and throttling had exceptions for reasonable network management, which in the Comcast case maybe you know at least from their side it may have been reasonable network management if all of their upstream traffic was full of torrents and people were complaining that they couldn't get other services to work. Uh, so that's a general I guess take on per se rules versus case by case adjudication. But when I guess talking about other forms of you know, discrimination in the ISP context, like paid prioritization, if you know, my ISP, you know, Comcast, want to strike an exclusive deal with you know, Sony PlayStation to prioritize you know, Sony gaming traffic over Xbox traffic, you know, arguably that would harm Microsoft or Steam or Nintendo, but it would you know, arguably benefit consumers. So I guess in a case like that, I would like to see a case by case adjudication ex post rather than ex ante ban. Um, but that's just one example. There's lots of others. I, I, I will push. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was going to say that um, this discussion is in danger of being overtaken by what Harold Demsetz called the Nirvana fallacy, which is it's very easy to look at a very dynamic and uh, uh, complex uh, uh, industry and, and uh, the products it offers and how consumers interact with it and to perceive imperfections, and then to say what we need is a government <coughs> intervention to do X, uh, assuming that the government intervention will be, for some reason, perfect, hence nirvana, but more relevantly, less imperfect than whatever market outcomes uh, uh, arise. This, uh, this debate uh, about net neutrality, particularly, uh, 
is terribly reminiscent. Anybody who is familiar with the history of railroad regulation, it's terribly reminiscent of the earliest history of the federal government experimenting with economic regulation. Very similar concerns were expressed. You know, farmer, uh, you know, farmer Brown in Kansas noticed that when that when his grain got to Chicago to market, uh, it was uh, not as competitive with with Farmer Lee, who lived in another part of the state or in a different state, because they were paying different ra railroad rates. Well, that was the original impetus for antitrust law, and there are a lot of efforts at both the state and federal level to regulate that. And in fact, it was regulated in 1887 when Congress created the Interstate Commerce Commission and empowered it uh, ultimately with these, uh, with these incredibly rigid regulations uh, over price, over entry, over service, over every aspect of railroad operations. Um, ultimately, under the reed Bullwinkle Act, uh, rate bureaus, which are nothing more nor less than carrier cartels, were permitted to be formed. The whole thing was regarded as such a catastrophe that, you know, criticism of the ICC and that system of handling rate discrimination originated as, as early as the Kennedy administration, and it was reformed in the 70s and 80s, and in fact in 1996 the Interstate Commerce Commission was flat out abolished. And unfortunately the ICC had become the model for the regulation of just about every other major industry that attracted uh, federal regulation, uh, you know, regulation at the federal level, uh, which would include uh, ocean shipping and aviation uh, and, and, uh, and energy uh, generation and transmission. Uh, and in fact, I, I love it when people, I, I, and I'm thrilled when people still point out, I heard this a couple of weeks ago, the ICC, in fact, was given initial regulatory authority over the electromagnetic spectrum. It is, it is it is the predecessor of the Federal Communications Commission. And uh, the, uh, the defects of ICC regulation of railroad rates are very much foreseeable in the, pr in the proposals for regulation of, uh, of, uh, interstate in, uh, of internet access rates uh, that, are, that are now being heard. So, right. so, so oh, I, I really, go, go, go I, ahead. I, I, I and I am, I am loath to, to turn this into my fourth net neutrality panel of the month of October. You don't have <laughs> so, so I, w I will just say we wouldn't, we wouldn't be having the, uh, well, you know, I, I'll just leave it at that, actually. Well, we, <laughs> I, I, it seemed like we reached a consensus on ex post case by case rules, so I'll, I'll, I'd like to now, uh, that was a joke, I'd like to yeah. move <laughs> To uh, let me, if it's okay, I think we're at the we're at a, a point in time now because we're a little pressed on time. If, if anybody in the audience has any questions for the panel, <coughs> would you mind raising your hand and I'll call on you. And if you could introduce yourself quickly and then have a question instead of a statement, that would be awesome. Go ahead. Uh, Carl Zabo of NetChoice. Uh, in in part to the less vocal side of the table. I mean, it, it seems like we're treating tech wildly different from corporeal uh, issues like. Uh, let's remember, Walmart is four times as large as Amazon, as fun, but when Walmart acquired Whole Foods, everyone kind of, kind of freaked out. And Walmart bought uh, Jet.com, which is a direct competitor with Walmart.com, and nobody batted an eye. So it seems like there's, there's a mistreatment or a, a false treatment of tech <coughs> in a way that we're not treating retail and physical physical presence, and we wouldn't consider anti-competitive in the real world. And I wonder if, has anyone considered that maybe we're being extra judgmental on tech because it's new and exciting, as opposed to maybe it's just kind of the same old, because I didn't hear an establishment of why the existing rules don't work. And Okay. Um, Who first? Yeah. I'll go first. Go first. And that's exactly right. And uh, I think there's a perception that is historical in human nature uh, to fear new, to fear big. And that's why uh, <coughs> these kind of voices are being raised. And that's why it's so important to understand the history and the evolution of antitrust and to understand that consumer welfare is the right standard and to allow the agencies to do their job on the right e the, under the right economic test to get the right outcomes for consumers. And that's why, for example, Whole Foods, the acquisition of Amazon, of Whole Foods by Amazon was approved. And that's why we need to be very serious when we, when we raise these topics about whether we should change antitrust or, or norms or not. Because the perceptions 
thankfully don't make the law. And thanks to that check, those checks and balances that exist here and in the EU as well, with the courts deciding and certain legal standards, we, we, we managed to evolve. So I think it's very important to, to, to have in mind that we as human beings, we have, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to frame it, we, we, we have fears. Let's put it this way. Go ahead, Dan. And I, I'd like yeah, to answer I, that. I, um, I think, uh, I, to put words in your mouth, I would call it the regulatory reflex. And that was part of my point about the ICC. People saw a phenomenon that was, that was very significantly influencing them. They were fearful of what would happen because everything was so, was so novel. And they said, let, let, let's appoint uh, a, a commission to set the rates, which turned out to be a catastrophic mistake that wasn't undone for, for over a hundred years. So, so we need to avoid the regulatory reflex. But I wanted to add though, it is true, I think, that uh, some of these uh, uh, platform businesses have uh, elements that, are, that must be taken into account in the antitrust analysis that are, are different from you know, what, we, what we would regard as sort of you know, nuts and bolts type industries. I, I think the best illustration of that is the question of interchange rates for uh, credit card uh, credit card systems like Visa or or Mastercard? When when those systems started up in the 1970s, there was also a regulatory reflex there, and there was uh, an antitrust suit begun, uh, saying that the the fact that the system determined the rate of compensation required between merchants who received cards and banks who, uh, who issued cards to cardholders. You see, mer merchant gives you goods and gets nothing in return except a slip of paper. Takes the slip of paper and goes and says, hey, your visa, uh, your, your, uh, a guy with a visa card came in here and gave me this visa card and I gave him some goods. You owe me 100 bucks. So visa says, great, go to the bank where, where that consumer, the guy who got the goods, got his Visa card. So you go to the bank. What if the bank says, oh great, here's 10 bucks. Okay, so the Visa system said, oh no, 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 not 10 bucks, you know, three, four percent, whatever. That's, that's the interchange rate. And there was a situation where the fixing of that rate was alleged to be classic cartel price fixing by, by an antitrust plaintiff. And the 11th Circuit very wisely looked at that and said, uh-uh. No, that's not price fixing. That's an interchange fee in a four-party payment system. So there was a perfect illustration of how a, a, a discriminating, uh, discriminating is the wrong word, a, yeah. <laughs> a sophisticated and well-informed um, uh, analysis under the traditional antitrust standard under the Sherman Act led to the right result, which was you're out of court. So. Um, let me just take it on real quick too, and, and then we'll go to the next question, that's okay. I mean, I, 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 I give you a two-part answer. One is I think you could make an argument with a straight face that the kind of innovation that's going on around the edges of the platforms that Facebook and Google and Amazon control is arguably uh, more important than what's going on in a, than the innovation at the edge of some brick and mortar establishment. But even if you rejected that argument, uh, I think it's perfectly fine, I go back to my Cable Act 1992, Section 616 protections, to come up with a, a set of protections that addresses a very specific issue. Think about a cable operator in 1992 saying, uh, don't impose those non-discrimination obligations on me because you're, you should be focusing instead on Walmart, right? And no one, would, no one would buy into that argument. That wouldn't be a defense of whether or not it was intelligent at the time to, to establish those sorts of protections. Let me take, Neil, how about, how about you? Uh, Neil Chilson, uh, Acting Chief Technologist with the FTC. And Meredith, I love that you emphasize the, you know, when you started your statement about net neutrality, that the, you, know, you have to go back to what the consumer injury is, and you focused on that. And I think in the net neutrality debate, we've, we've at least talked a lot about what are potential consumer injuries. Um, I think the argument has shifted around to a sort of virtuous cycle, edge, edge innovator harm as well, and maybe that was the emphasis in the 2015 report. But at least it started with what the consumer harm was. This broader debate, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I haven't heard, I've, I've heard what the possible solution might be, but I haven't heard what the consumer injury is here that matters, and even if it's a harm to innovation, how does that, how is that tied back to consumer injury? And if we don't have, 
evidence of that, then what are we trying to accomplish, and how would we know if we succeeded? So I, I, again, as a consumer advocate, would like to hop on that. Um, I, again, this sort of first thing I opened up with is non-monetary harms are just inherently very difficult to quantify and thus and very difficult to present to a court. Um, you know, any case that you build that does not present a dollar figure in some form is going to have a litigation risk. Um, and to the extent that we do recognize that there are dignitary harms, uh, you know, about having your private information out there, this was, you know, a lot, this is a recurring theme in the fight over the FCC's privacy rulemaking, um, which has since been sent to its grave by the CRA. Uh, you know, how do you quantify the fact that my data can be aggregated and passed along to someone else? And I may actually economically benefit from this on some level. Um, you know, I might get a discount on something that I need. Uh, having said that, I still am not comfortable with my data being out there, even if no one's ripping me off, if no one's taking out fake credit cards on my name. Like, there is still a harm there. It is just very difficult to articulate. And I think when we're getting, especially in the privacy frontier, we're really hitting the frontiers of how do we think about these things? Do we want to recognize this as a cognizable risk, or do we just, as a panelist from someone else I was uh, with a couple weeks ago said, just throw your hands in the air and say, privacy is dead. And we just have to live with that now. Um, well, you should come to our December 12th uh, workshop on informational injuries. I will be there. I really want to get on those two, but somebody else needs to do it for me. Slip that in there. Why don't you answer, then we'll get yeah, another yeah. question. So, I want to make sure we get, we get so all the questions out. So I, I uh, second the comments, the comments about how hard it can be to monetize these kinds of harms. But from where I sit within the tech industry, I see the assumptions that we had 20 years ago about our industry no longer being reliable, right? When, when I grew up studying computer science, uh, I assumed that the largest and most successful businesses that we had today would not necessarily be the same ones that we see in 10 years because the internet is inherently disruptive. It was engineered to be that way, and from that is the source of its socioeconomic benefit to our, to our society. Uh, this is a little redundant, but you, you know where I'm getting at with that. Um, that assumption is no longer true. Like, I, I am very much of the opinion based on where I see dollars going and businesses going and partnerships going and, and users going uh, that we have to assume, unless we change something, the same five, frightful five, as Farhad Manji calls them, businesses that dominate the, the internet ecosystem today will be in place in the future. And, and that's to me, feels like not the internet and certainly not the open, generative internet that has led to so much uh, economic and and individual benefit over the past year. Yeah. So I don't know how to I don't know how to quantify it, it's, but it's there. We we fight like this. Like cat, <laughs> like cats on Twitter. We'll bring it back up on Twitter. But I always say that you know it's it's the next round of innovation. It's that if if Facebook is going to make life miserable for what for uh, for Snapchat or for for legitimate news uh, uh, publishers, for example, you know the question is, are they going to throw in the towel, or we're going to see less investment, less innovation in future periods? on the edge of these platforms. Yeah. You had a question at the end. Yeah. Sure, uh, John Bird with the Business Coalition for Fair Competition. Different angle uh, from the monopoly issue. The private sector switch it to the public sector monopolies. Say so just within the federal agencies, take a look at some of the startups recently, the digital services at OMB, 18F, at GSA, even GPO expanding out of printing and publishing with the software that they've developed in-house, you know, in IP, sometimes copycatting private sector solutions and starting up the rain. Um, the damage is that the Congressional moratorium on OMB Circular A76 prevents the private sector from even competing with the public sector for these kind of commercial activities. Therefore, you literally have government monopolies in-house. So to the regulatory opportunities for federal agencies to actually take a look at their own in-house capabilities, have you all given some thought or are you aware of any ideas that are underway, or what kind of advice would you give to the federal regulators that could potentially now be looking at the in-house solutions offered by federal agencies that directly duplicate and compete with the private sector, take work away from small business or large business, but also the actual consumer or the actual government employees, as well as the general public that are looking at the data that's on these uh, software and website opportunities. Go ahead. I'll jump in. Uh, this goes back to points I made earlier. Uh, so the sorts of business arrangements you're speaking of are exclusive dealing. You know, we have uh, these exclusive arrangements with these companies on a private contracting basis with the government. And you know, antitrust law used to treat exclusive dealing as per se illegal. We eventually came around and subjected to rule of reason analysis because even if it is exclusive for the term length and it's anti-competitive for the length of that term, 
the, you know, the, as long as the contract does expire at some point and then you have competitive bidding for renewal of that contract, then there is still market forces that can come in and you know, it may not be ideal competition, but it's still competitive and you can get good outcomes as long as you have open competitive bidding for when those contracts are first put in place or renewed. Okay. This is when the, the contractors are going to allow to come and compete. So there's going to be an opportunity for other, other questions. Go ahead. Uh, Jonathan Band on the attorney private practice. Assuming that there is a problem, and I agree that maybe there isn't, but assuming there is a problem, isn't part of the solution to look in uh, adjacent spaces to antitrust? So, for example, you know, the panel hasn't mentioned intellectual property, but that seems to me to be. Certain area, you know, certainly an area where you know, making sure that and I, that IP is not uh, applied in a manner that really uh, leads to uh, less competition would be a, a critical thing to consider. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. We've got. Uh, <laughs> So this is, I, I also work on copyright issues, um, and aside from when I'm not picking on ISPs, um, but you know, it's a classic problem, and I think this faces essentially every sufficiently specialized school of thought, is that when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I think there is a tendency to push on this idea that antitrust is all we need. We just need robust antitrust enforcement, and we'll solve the market problems, and it'll be fine, and we can all go on our happy way. And that's like, Fundamentally not true, especially when you're dealing with industries that have very strong network effects that tend toward a natural monopoly. Um, you know, we broke up AT&T into nine, seven, nine baby bells, and now they're just, we've got four major providers, like two of which are directly descended from the bell breakup. Um, and so, you know, to some extent, I think you need to, to uh, always keep an eye on, you know, assuming that the reality of life is that a lot of these antitrust things like break of some investments are just going to sort of reverse themselves in, in the natural course of economic business. Um, you know, you've got to be able to bring in what kind of small tweaks to behavior, what sort of regulatory apparatus can you bring to bear, you know, with the lightest possible touch that will still manage to get you to the outcome that you want. Um, let me let me see if there's one more question. I know we're running up a bit against time, uh, and we're going to come down the line with uh, preferred remedies uh, to close, to so start thinking about your preferred remedies. These two questions? Yeah, let me get, let me get these two questions. Go ahead. Okay. So this notion that... Uh, Oh, sorry. Does some does anyone have an, have an answer about a, a merger that would go a different them together? Well, this is a merger yeah, that would true. go a different way. It's different than how I want to finish. Yeah, no, that's a merger fair. that would go a different way had had something uh, other than the <laughs> consumer welfare standard uh, been applied by an agency. Well, certainly Amazon Whole Foods. You think about there were there were employment effects that were likely not considered under the consumer welfare standard that may may have caused things to go a different way under under a broader standard. Does anyone else have, have any other answers? Thank God they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm agnostic. I'm just telling you no. one. Anyway. Because um, whenever there has been a remedy that includes, I'm talking about other jurisdictions, Zambia, uh, that they impose a remedy uh, to address employment issues, they were actually regulating the contracts of those employees. And I don't think you want to see that in the U.S. because you lose freedom, and you lose. Uh, the, it goes to the core basic of market economy, right? So, uh, if I, I'm not saying I, I don't worry about unemployment or employment, I do worry and a lot. I'm just arguing that it, antitrust is not the right forum, and mergers are not the right forum because who stops you then from taking care of environmental issues, or I don't know any other thing that you might think about. And so we really need to make sure that. Uh, understand that antitrust, it's about consumer welfare, 
and make sure that whenever we, we enforce antitrust, we do take care about consumer welfare. All of the other aspects that you might worry about, let's look for a different forum. Go ahead. I was just wondering, uh, without there being a major antitrust case in decades, is that in itself a problem in terms of uh, kind of complacency and uh, the kind of culture that develops in, in the industry of, of sort of seeing the cop kind of asleep? Uh, um, so uh, yeah, I think it was said at one point there hadn't been an antitrust case, or maybe it was a monopoly case. When you rephrase it, there hasn't been a, there hasn't been a pure innovation based case brought under sex. So there right. have been antitrust cases. Right, like the Apple yeah. uh, and e Amazon ebooks case. They were convicted of price fixing. Amazon settled. Apple kept fighting it. Eventually lost in court. Um, so the FTC caught them for using market power to fix prices in that case. So kind I think our antitrust, bit. yeah. Right. I think our agencies have been relatively active and rigorous in investigating the space, but some people would like, you know, more blood, you know, more outcome, more enforcement. Uh, I think we're more or less getting things right. But that's my well, and fundamentally, we're we're facing a court system that is still relying on a vocabulary that is becoming increasingly less of a good fit to the kind of markets that we're seeing. Um, when you talk about like, tr you know, we were discussing earlier Facebook and uh, Instagram, like that is under some readings not a horizontal merger and in some readings it's not really a vertical merger either because it's not really an input in the traditional sense um, and so we're sort of at a loss for how to um, adequately uh, sort of even verbalize I think a lot of the harms that we're running into or a lot of the things that we're concerned about or even like properly characterizing the market in an analogous way to what the courts are used to dealing with and so there is an enormous risk going into a lot of these um, potential litigations. Very briefly, I'll just reference the Center for American Progress's report from about a year ago, late 2016, that is starting to make the case that the past few decades of, um, let's call it tolerance of vertical mergers, is in fact not in our country's best interest. So there's a lot of, of uh, concern from that wing of this uh, in there. With the last, say, f four minutes, what I'd like to do is just come down the panel, starting with Tom, and, and ask you this question. If, if, if you could write the laws, um, what would you do to solve this problem, if at anything, if anything? Okay, uh, so, yeah, I guess as I've been talking about history the whole time, I don't think we really need a paradigm shift or a big change in law. I think we have good standards and tools. I mean, I think there's consensus across the panel that pure innovation harms are very difficult to prove, but we have to keep in mind type one and type two errors, you know, the costs of false positives versus false negatives and it may be very tough to prove you know, an innovation case, but maybe that's a good thing for the system, um, even if it might not be good for individual competitors trying to bring those cases, so. Go ahead. Um, I will react by saying which problem, because I think that uh, innovation can, is in most cases embedded in the traditional leverage of dominance cases, but let's assume that there could be a problem there. I think we really need to make make it very clear that antitrust is about consumer welfare and shifting that standard uh, is like the butterfly, butterfly wing, you know? You can break the ecosystem that has created the US to be the leaders in innovation. Be careful with that and be careful with exporting that, those kind of ideas elsewhere. Dan? Yeah, I guess I would say um, the, uh, the, the, the almost every subject, specific subject we've discussed ISPs, Facebook, what have you, uh, it's probably going to be much more productive for the foreseeable future to look for the imperfections in existing government policies that make it, that, that limit the capacity of private market competition to self-regulate. That's the first place, uh, uh, that's first, it's kind of like this de debate in Obamacare, not to introduce any, any uh, you know, controversial subjects, but remember that a very small part of that debate is why do we prohibit insurance companies in state A from offering plans to, uh, to uh, people in state B? What is the reason for the prohibition on interstate insurance competition? It makes zero sense to me. There are, uh, without going into the details obviously, there are zillions of little examples of that all over the telecommunications marketplace having to do with both local and FCC regulation. To me, that's the first place to look. Okay. Anna? 
Uh, I think we need to make sure that the focus on antitrust fundamentally remains on the consumer effect. Again, I say this self-serving as a consumer advocate. Um, but, you know, fundamentally we need to start from addressing the kinds of harms that consumers are potentially facing. And we are facing new kinds of harms that we have not traditionally had to deal with in anything close to the systemic way that we are dealing with them now. Um, and so to the extent that we can recenter that, we have to come up with better ways of talking about this. We have to, you know, possibly take a second look at what, how we define markets, how we define products. We have to figure out some kinds of flexibility in how we define these things uh, going forward. And we have to find a way to address that in a court context as well, you know, where courts are notoriously sort of resistant to coming in with innovative ideas. Um, so I think that's, that's probably where we need to start. So two separate things. The first is better metrics for measuring innovation harm. I think it's something that there's a, a, some amount of agreement on here. Uh, the second is a thumb on the scale all in favor of interoperability and uh, transparent third-party accessible APIs or application programming interfaces. Um, because without that, we won't even have the space technically to enable private competition. <coughs> And with that, we are in a position to consider other remedies as, uh, as we need like to data down the road. Data portability? Not quite. Not quite okay. the same thing. Um, it, it will take longer than the time okay. we have left to get into what a third-party accessible API means in practice. But, um, but we need that technical layer in order to make sure that we can have these other conversations down the road. And, and that's, that's the core of my worry. Okay. And if I could <coughs> fix things, I would uh, create a net tribunal that would um, subject both ISPs and dominant uh, tech platforms like Facebook and Google to a uh, non-discrimination standard, uh, and you would solve the net neutrality problem and the discrimination problem that's going on in the, in the tech space as well with one fell swoop. Well, thank you so much for, for coming. We're going to have to end it with the truth. And uh, catch you and we're done. next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Solving the world's problems one hour at a time. It gets